Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Hill. We're coming to you from Full Global Headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm joined by senior analysts Jason Moser and Andy Cross. Thanks for being here, guys. Hey, Chris. You. We're going to be talking about dividend stocks. We're going to be taking your questions about all kinds of stocks, so go ahead and get those ready. Andy Cross, let me start with you. Dividend stocks, a great way to invest. For those unfamiliar, what are the basics? What is a dividend and why do people like these stocks? Yeah, very, just so very quickly and uh, simply, it's essentially a payment that companies make to their shareholders, their common shareholders, so your basic um, your basic shareholder out there, and they pay, in the U.S., We usually they usually pay it on a quarterly basis. Over in Europe, sometimes they do on a half. There's also special dividends, but essentially, they pay out maybe once a year. It's a payment of uh, earnings that companies make to their share, shareholders as a recognition that the shareholders have invested in the company and they deserve a payout. Uh, Jason, when we're looking to invest in any company, there are certain metrics that we're looking at. If you're looking at a retail company, same store sales, a basic metric you want to get. Same thing for dividend stocks. What are a couple of the metrics we should be looking at? Yeah, I mean, there are some direct metrics that we really want to pay attention to. One that really comes to mind is the payout ratio. I mean, this is something that tells you how much the company is making, how profitable it is versus the, the amount they're forking over in dividends each quarter. Uh, so the payout ratio really tells us if they can can afford that dividend, you like to see that number on the lower side. Yep. You start seeing that thing creep up towards 60, 70, 80. Boy, if you see it getting over 100, you really need to start asking some questions. Um, I mean, then you look at things like the dividend yield, actually. Like, this is a, a recognition of the amount of money the company is paying out in dividends per year uh, compared to its stock price as a percentage of its stock price. Uh, typically, you're going to see something in that 1, 2, 3 percent range, and over time, you like to see that grow. Uh, you don't like to see companies with these really, really high dividend yields, six, seven, eight percent. Uh, there are certain cases where that's okay, whether it's an MLP or a REIT or something like that. But oftentimes that can be a sign that perhaps a company won't be able to sustainably afford that dividend. Uh, but then indirectly, I mean, paying attention just to the fundamentals of the business itself, making sure that the top line revenue is growing, making sure the company is making uh, plenty of free cash flow, because really ultimately that's what dividends are. They're, uh, you know, I tell my kids, dividends are a nice little thank you. They're a thank you card from the company. They say thank you for owning our stock every quarter. Uh, uh, but that's cash out the door, right? That's not some non-cash charge. So make sure the company's making enough cash to be able to support it. Yeah, and I'll just add dividend growth too. We like to see companies, yeah. not not every company, but a lot of these great companies that have been successful dividend payers over the years and great stocks have been able to grow that dividend, It'll tend to be a lower payout ratio so they can, they can add that dividend so they have earnings growth and they continue to inch up the dividends over time. That's a nice uh, metric to watch, and the companies that have been really successful in the market over the last 20, 30, 50 years have been dividend payers that have been able to grow that dividend. It's interesting if you think about maybe the last decade or so, it's almost like dividends have had a stigma that has been removed. There was a long stretch of time with a company like Apple where the big question around Apple was, boy, they're building up their cash balance. Are they going to start paying a dividend? And there were people saying, well, no, we don't want them to pay a dividend. Then they won't be cool anymore. I mean, people were literally saying, if you start paying a dividend, then it's all of a sudden you qualify for Social Security. You're an old company. You're no longer cool. But that's really gone now. And it seems like more and more growth companies uh, are paying a dividend. Yeah, I think people start, uh, investors uh, start focusing on how management teams and board of directors are allocating capital. And some of these companies have gotten so big and so profitable. I mean, the, the amount of billions of dollars that Apple generates each quarter in profits, and they literally cannot invest that fast enough to be able to put to good use inside the business. So the ways they can uh, deliver returns for the shareholders is to pay a dividend and buy back stock. And dividends send a real signal to the market that these companies have stable cash flows because if you cut a dividend, Chris, maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. You cut a dividend, that's a bad sign for shareholders. They don't like that. So once you start paying a dividend, you gotta keep paying it. So it's a sign of stability. And some of the companies that have done so well in the marketplace over years have now started recognizing, hey, a dividend's a good return of, of capital for shareholders. Yeah, I'm glad to see that stigma disappearing because, I mean, let's face it, we're gonna talk about cool, money's cool, right? I mean, everybody likes money. back money. in my pocket. Right. Right, exactly. I mean, cash in the pocket, it, you can do a lot with it. Um, again, I pulled some interesting 
data from uh, Robert Brokamp, our certified financial planner here uh, in Rule Your Retirement. And it's very interesting to look. The math doesn't lie here. You're looking over this century, okay, not the last 100 years, this century that we're in right now. Uh, you look at the performance of the S&P 500. The index has returned up to this point about 105%. Uh, on a price-only basis. But when you incorporate dividends into that, look at the index's total return, all of a sudden it jumps up to 200%. So you can see immediately that the dividends make a really big difference, particularly the longer your holding period. Yeah, what's interesting is if you look historically, uh, the dividend return to the overall S&P 500, the general market, um, historically it's been about 40%. Now recently it's kind of pulled back a little bit because a lot of the companies, although some of the growth companies haven't paid dividends, as we get a lot of these really exciting super growth companies, a lot of these cloud-based, SaaS-based technology companies, they tend not to pay a dividend. There's a lot of money going in there, so the percentage of companies paying a dividend may have gone has gone down. And so the overall, as the returns of stocks continue to do very well, dividends haven't overall haven't contributed as much to that return picture. Yeah, we talk about those SaaS companies, those growth companies, and we go back to that payout ratio like we were talking about just a minute ago. If you if you look at the payout ratio for a lot of those companies, it's going to come up N-A. Yes. Because they don't make any net income to begin with. And if you don't make any net income, you can't have a payout ratio. So, so that's kind of where that works. Ultimately, you like to see a dividend, but you want to make sure it's coming from a company that's making money to begin yeah. with. Uh, I know you guys have a couple of dividend stocks you want to uh, spotlight for folks, and I do want to get to a couple of the pitfalls, but real quick, Andy, I mean, you talk about companies that pay dividends year after year increasing. We've got to mention dividend aristocrats, yeah. which is a phrase that some viewers might be uh, familiar with. I mean, these are companies, you talk about track records, they've increase their dividend every year for 25 straight years or more. Yeah, so these are companies, there are about just just shy of 60 companies currently on the list. We're talking companies like Cintas, Pepsi, J&J, Medtronic, Target, Sherwin Williams. I mean, these are companies that have had the cash and the profit picture to be able to pay out in the growth picture to be able to pay out a dividend and increase that dividend for the last 25 years. Now, here's what's really interesting about this, and Jason touched on this before. If you look at the performance of the dividend aristocrats, over the last three years, on average, that's actually trailed the market by a percentage point or two. But when you look at it over the last 5, 10, 15 years, the return of those dividends, the proven nature of those businesses, the return picture is much better than the S&P 500. And dividend payers, certainly th those companies that don't pay a dividend at all, are, tr are the worst performers, the trailing performers. The only one that's slightly worse than that, the companies that cut their dividend, Chris. So dividend aristocrats, those companies have shown over time they can pay the dividend, and that's really been valuable for shareholders over the long term. Definitely a red flag anytime you see uh, not just a dividend cut, but in the case more recently with General Electric, a couple of dividend cuts in a row. <laughs> um, Jason, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. I mean, we've been talking about a lot of the positives here, but there are some pitfalls when it comes to dividend investing. I mean, there definitely can be. I mean, one of the things that I, I look back on, and it, it's tangible for me because I talked with people who were really affected by this. You know, you just go back to the, the Great Recession, right? When really it seemed like everything was kind of going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak. And a lot of the companies that were really feeling the brunt of this pain were big banks. And big banks, for a really long time, the investing case in those banks was twofold. It's going to be a nice long-term holding. They're going to keep on paying a dividend. They're going to keep raising that dividend, and they're going to keep buying back stock. So it's going to be a nice way to keep on returning value to shareholders in a market that really probably isn't going to go away. And lo and behold, a lot of these banks really got caught behind the eight ball. A lot of them had to slash their dividends meaningfully. And I talked to a lot of folks who were, they were more in that protect your wealth stage of life, right? A little bit older, focused on protecting their wealth, a little bit less concerned with growing it. They had a lot of exposure to these bank stocks with these big dividends that got just killed. They lost a lot of real tangible money immediately. And so I think just from the diversification point of view, while we love dividends, it, you got to make sure that you're not just dividends, right? I mean, bad things can happen. Well, and Andy, uh, let's be fair to the companies. In a lot of cases, when a company is cutting its dividend, um, while dividend investors may not want to see it, a lot of times for the company, that's the right fiscal move. Yeah, Chris, they have to. They have to preserve capital. And so they stop doing a lot of things, not just paying dividends. I mean, they often let go of employees. You mentioned GE 
and there are certainly others, and Jason's exactly right, during the financial crisis. So um, this is w one reason why when you're looking for these dividend companies, companies that have a proven track record, the profit, the uh, the business model and the profit picture to be able to sustain that dividend, they're operating in markets that are growing, and they have a management team that's really committed to that. So um, when you think about that low payout ratio and dividend yield, it certainly matters as well, too. So those are the kind of companies you want to find, and you find the opposite, those are ones you really want to stay away from. It, we find those businesses where their model is based on a commodity and oil. I'm looking just specifically in your <laughs> right direction. Your direction. Um, I mean, when you see uh, those oil companies, when oil prices plummet, I mean, are they going to be able to sustain those dividend yields that they've been paying out? Uh, chances are it might be a little bit more difficult, as we talked about here over the past week with the Saudi Arabian uh, crisis there with the drone attacks. I mean, it, it, and that's nothing really of oil's fault. It's just a geopolitical risk that comes about. But the fact of the matter is, you have to incorporate that into your decision making, understanding that there are bigger forces at play uh, that can affect a business model if it's based on some kind of a commodity like oil, and, and that can make uh, sustaining those dividend payments really difficult. All right, keep the questions coming. We're going to be getting to those in just a second. And if you like the video, please give us a thumbs up. It helps other people find the video, and we're trying to help more people. Um, let's get to the dividend stocks. Jason, you're up first. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, everybody likes to look at Apple. I think Apple's really the darling of the tech world, so to speak. But man, has Microsoft just <laughs> really made a resurgence. I mean, I have to say, I, I was a little bit skeptical many years ago, but to watch what's happened since Satya Nadella took over has been nothing short of remarkable. And what he's done there in building out just, you know, the cloud offering, really focusing on uh, doubling down on, the, on what they do really well in enterprise software. Uh, this is just a company that makes a ton of cash on, on an annual basis. And like we were saying before, companies that make big big amounts of free cash flow, they've got to do something with that cash. Uh, oftentimes it comes in the form of dividends, raising dividends, buying back shares. Uh, Microsoft is going to be a company, I think, where their software is going to continue to play a big role in our lives for many years to come. Uh, they are certainly developing cool new technology on the augmented reality front with HoloLens and all of those different types of things. Uh, I mean, just to put some numbers around that, they brought in about $40 billion in free cash flow last Last year, uh, they're spitting that money back out to shareholders in the form of dividends and share repurchases. And I suspect over the coming years, we're going to continue to see that because while they're really big, I don't think it's reasonable to expect them to double over the course of the next five or even maybe 10 years, but they're going to keep on bringing in a lot of money and they're going to have to do something with it. And, and shareholders are going to benefit from that, I think. Well, and timely news that uh, Microsoft announcing today they're hiking their quarterly dividend by 11%. I can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that that had anything to do with my selection. <laughs> Today, but it might have had something to do with my selection today. Andy Cross, what about you? So Jason, Ch Microsoft, such a, an amazing company, a very large company, more than a trillion dollars mm -hmm. now market cap. I'm actually going to the other side. I'm going to a company called Houlihan Loki, which is a $3 billion uh, boutique investment bank. Uh, while it's small, its numbers are actually quite large. It's one of the largest uh, investment banks that consults on mergers and acquisitions, bankruptcies and restructuring and corporate actions, and then advisory services as well. So it's a $3 billion company. It's only been public for a few years. They started paying a dividend when they went public in 2015. They've doubled that dividend over time. Now it pays a 31 cent quarterly dividend. Uh, and the stock's at uh, about 46. The yield's about a little over 2.5%, so I'd like that. That's much higher when you think about the, where the 10-year Treasury note is today, and it's at one eight maybe. So you have a nice little difference there. Um, it is a, it's an investment bank. Um, like I said, it, from a volume perspective, it's one of the largest. It actually contributes a lot of consulting work to these small, uh, smaller firms in the mid market space. Um, but what I like about it is very profitable. They have returns on equity north of twenty percent. They have a very nice balance sheet. They have um, profit picture somewhere between ten and twenty percent. And even during the financial crisis, Jason, you mentioned the big banks. Uh, Houlihan Loki actually maintained their profitability and kept their operating margins above 10%. So Amen. when I think about the growth picture, they've been able to grow revenues 13% per year for the last five years, profits more than 20%. The payout ratio is below 50%. So when I add that all up, I see a very a smaller company being able to grow their dividend over time. The stock's not that expensive at 17 times earnings. So it's a much different picture. It's more volatile. Microsoft has a volatility beta of less than one. 
Holy Hands Loki's at 30% higher than that. So it's a little bit more volatile, but I like the growth picture and the ability for the stock to grow because of the dividends. It's like peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah, Man, you you put those two together, <laughs> I think you got a pretty wicked combination like right it. there. All right, let's get to the questions from the audience. Uh, first up is Dan, who asks, is it better to have dividend stocks in a Roth IRA, a traditional IRA, or just a regular investment account? Any preference there, guys? Uh, well. I think the the traditional wisdom says that if you keep your dividend paying stocks in tax advantaged accounts, whether that's a Roth or a traditional, that typically makes more sense as those dividends are not going to be taxed necessarily like they might be in a regular account. Uh, now with that said, when it comes to tax situations, I mean everybody's situation is unique, uh, so I encourage you to take a look at the bigger picture. But the conventional wisdom is keeping most of those dividend payers in your tax advantage accounts makes a little bit more sense. I will say for partnerships like master limited partnerships, you do not want those in tax advantage yeah. accounts because those are partnerships and the taxes are much different. You don't get the tax benefit from the MLPs, the master limited partnerships in a tax advantage account like you would in a, a non-tax advantage account. So that's the one, but I agree with Jason. I think um, I own a lot of dividend stocks and, and not in a tax advantage account. And I see every year those um, dividends get taxed. And so I pay the tax man for those. Uh, Robert asks, is it better to reinvest your dividend via a drip or take the cash? A drip for those unfamiliar, dividend reinvestment plan. Um, it seems like a personal preference kind of thing. Uh, certainly if you're, a big fan of the company and you think it has good growth prospects, um, just you know, getting more shares might be the way to go. Yeah, I do tend to like reinvesting from the perspective that it just kind of protects you from yourself, <laughs> it takes some, yeah. some of that impulsive decision making maybe uh, off of the table, so to speak. Uh, but by the same token, I will say that typically I take my dividends in the form of cash because I like building that cash balance up and redeploying it to not, you know, new great ideas. Um, again, I mean, it depends on if you're in that grow your wealth phase of life or the protect your wealth phase of life. And so you're right, it is a personal decision. Uh, one that you have to consider. Wow, you do like that money in your pocket thing. You, know, you got something hey, going man, for you. Hey, man, you know. Yeah, it is a personal one. I, For example, my Home Depot, my Pepsi, my Comcast, I reinvest those shares. And so I've just been, I've held Home Depot for decades and I just love to see that stock compound like that and get more and more shares. Um, my parents, for example, they're in a much different stage than I am. They depend on their dividends um, for income. So they need that cash and they don't reinvest the dividends. So it really depends on where you are and what you want your portfolio to do. It's a little bit of like, what'd you say either earlier, Jason, chocolate and vanilla or peanut yeah, butter no, and jelly. You, you got a little bit of both. chocolate together, maybe a little Reese's peanut butter cup. Yeah, you just gotta, you gotta understand how those dividends are, what they're gonna do for your personal yeah. finance situation and make sure your stock uh, selection in accordingly. Uh, a few people asking, should all companies aspire to pay dividends? Is there a time when a company should not pay a dividend? Uh, interesting question because it, it, we talk all the time about uh, one of the major things that company management has to do is allocate capital and it, it, paying a dividend and you sort of touched on this earlier Andy it seems like one of those things like if you're gonna start paying a dividend you better start thinking long term about how committed you are to this because once you start paying it very quickly people get used to it and it's not just people institutions on Wall Street maybe thinking about adding you to dividend funds and ETFs. Totally, you're, you're getting in indices. Married. Yeah, like you're, you're getting, you're getting like married. That. It's a, it's a, and, and it does add discipline and a lot of people will say, and I think it's truth, is especially when you look at the dividend aristocrats, it does add discipline. I mean, a company like Sherwin-Williams that has done so well and the stock has just done phenomenally well, they have that consistency of the dividend. It doesn't yield very much, but they have the consistency of growing that. Um, Berkshire Hathaway is a company, a very large company run by a very smart person and I own it personally has committed to not paying a dividend. <laughs> Warren Buffett just does not want to because he sees his job as allocating capital and he thinks he can do better than paying a dividend, which by the way has some, it's taxed at the corporate level, then you're taxed when you get the dividend at the income level as well too. So I don't think companies should necessarily um, aspire to it. Uh, it really depends on kind of how you want to think about your capital allocation strategy at the board level. It does feel like in some cases, it's almost like this sense of capitulation, like, 
all right, I guess we're going to pay a dividend. Like, you feel like when Berkshire, if Berkshire ever pays a dividend, it's going to be kind of like that. They're going to be like, well, I guess we'll pay a dividend. But, you know, we really don't want to because we feel like we can yeah. do so much more with that money. And that is what it boils down to, yeah. right? It's management thinks they can allocate that capital better. We'll let them try. But, you know, the track record is going to speak for itself. I think that was what happened with Apple. I mean, so uh, Chris Mint talked about it earlier. So many people were saying you, have, you generate billions and billions every quarter. You have billions on your balance sheet, you have outstanding returns on capital, but you cannot invest that money fast enough, so you need to return it back to shareholders, as they have, and it's been a very nice catalyst for Apple shareholders over the last couple years. But to go back to the dividend aristocrats for a second, it really does seem like one of the benefits of older companies and more mature management teams is the longer they have a track record, the better we as investors are, are able to evaluate how they are at capital allocation. Dividend aristocrats, they've got a really good track record of increasing that dividend. There are other companies out there, Jason, that they're not paying a dividend, but they've shown a good, they've demonstrated a good ability to deploy the cash either in investments or even in acquisitions. Hey, I'll, I'll go to what we talk about all the time is our baby Berkshire Hathaway, right? Markel Insurance. Yep. I mean, that's a company that a lot of us own here and a very similar model to Berkshire Hathaway and that it's an insurance business and that, that insurance business business helps it do so many other things, uh, one of which is this Markel Venture side of the business now where they are investing in and wholly owning uh, smaller businesses to build out this nice diversified uh, sort of cross section of the American economy, so to speak. They're not paying a dividend right now, but you know what? I don't want them to because I believe in Tom Gaynor and what they're doing there at the company. The track record tells us that they've gotten this far based on all of these awesome investments that they've made. And I'm really excited to hold those shares over the next hopefully 10 to 20 years, even longer, to see what they are able to do with that money uh, beyond just having to worry about pay, paying dividends. Because I do feel like a company at, at that stage of its, of its existence, there's no reason to pay a dividend because they have so many opportunities ahead of them. Great question from Warren who asked, The Motley Fool loves subscription businesses. What is your take on utilities? Aren't utilities the ultimate subscription business? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they are. They're also ultimately regulated very toughly. And I think their, their rates are set and um, it makes it, while they do have, cons they are, can, they are uh, known as dividend payers. And um, uh, over the years, lots of uh, investors have gone into utilities. Um, for our perspective, the growth picture and the regulated uh, nature of those just have not always made the greatest investments, exceptionally use of capital. Of course, Warren Buffett, and I, like I said, I own Berkshire Hathaway, so I'm owning a lot, I have a lot of exposure to utilities through, through the, um, the uh, mid-American business that Berkshire runs, uh, but the investment nature of utilities just doesn't necessarily warrant the capital appreciation, even though the dividends may be, um, may be uh, attractive. They tend to really ratchet up the debt levels. I mean, they yeah. can. They can afford to, essentially, because they have to. They're utilities. They can't disappear. Uh, but, but that can certainly add some uncertainty to, the, uh, uncertainty to the picture there. I mean, a company with really high debt levels, I mean, utility or not, you have to keep that, uh, keep that in mind. Just, from a yield perspective, when you look at the S&P 500 and the utilities in the S&P 500 on average are yielding 3.2%, that's much different. The tech companies in the S&P 500 that have yields are only yielding 1.3%. So a lot of people say, wow, utilities have that higher yielding picture so I can get that yield. That is true, but Jason, as Jason mentioned, the business, the regulated nature, just puts a little bit of uh, risk and uncertainty of just not the most um, attractive uh, investment opportunity and ultimately is a lot about total return. Tan asks, what is your take on Altria? This is a company facing a lot of backlash and long-term headwinds, but it also seems like a pretty compelling dividend stock. Uh, Altria, formerly known as Philip Morris, uh, a lot of people avoid this stock because uh, they're not interested in investing in tobacco, but from a dividend perspective, uh, this stock has been a monster. Yeah, and it's been one of the best performing stocks, and I actually own a little bit of it personally. I'm not really excited. I haven't added to it to, for years, and just like I said, it's a small part of my portfolio, and, and buy a little bit or get a little bit of the dividend. Um, and historically, it has been one of the best performing companies. Um, lots of challenges just uh, with its business and with its, with the consumer um, nature of uh, of its core product that I think a lot of people just may shy away from. Um, Ultimately, that's your kind of decision if you want to invest in a company like Altria, and you have to make sure the business is stable enough to be able to uh, sustain that dividend and make sure ultimately if they can grow that dividend. Um, and some people may see, well, the long-term nature of Altria's business is just not what I want to invest into. 
Uh, Jonathan asks, how are you feeling about AT&T or the other telecoms as dividend plays? <coughs> Their dividend yields look pretty good. Yeah, I got to say personally, having looked into AT&T and Verizon recently for augmented reality, uh, the reason why I'm looking at them for that purpose is they're the ones building out that 5G infrastructure, which is going to be uh, really a requirement for technology to make that next leap for things like artificial intelligence and augmented virtual reality to, to start playing bigger roles in our lives. Uh, these are ultimately utility stocks, right? I mean, they have these huge networks and they really can't go anywhere. I mean, they can't just shut them down. So they're going to be around, I think, for the time being. Uh, probably not the best growth story in the world, but they traditionally yield these really attractive dividends. And frankly, I don't see that going away anytime soon. Uh, so I do think they could, they could certainly serve a role uh, in anyone's portfolio as a lower risk way to get some utility exposure. Uh, then maybe, you know, they're playing a little bit more into the technology uh, wave as opposed to something like a water company or a gas company. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. A lot of moving parts, AT&T and its um, subsidiaries and Verizon making a lot of acquisitions into its space, then spinning their, getting rid of them and, and changing <laughs> them. So a lot, at the corporate level, a lot of changes. The yields are very attractive and historically has been a pretty good stable business to invest into. Uh, Minani asks, what happens to the dividend when a stock splits? Boy, I don't even remember the last time a stock in my portfolio split. It seems like <laughs> as dividends are getting more popular, stock splits are getting less popular. I guess that's true. Yeah, it does feel like probably a lot of uh, a lot of folks out there are taking pride in that bigger share price. I mean, I know from an absolute yeah. dollar perspective, it scares a lot of investors because they think the stock is too expensive. But let's not confuse price with value, right? We could probably do a whole other live stream on that alone. Um, ultimately, though, the dividend adjusts with the stock split. It's not like you're going to double your dividend. Uh, James asks, can you go over how to start dripping your dividends in your brokerage account? Again, dividend reinvestment plans, uh, such a great way uh, to get started investing. Yeah, I mean, I think that you just have to, number one, make sure that your brokerage has that capability. I don't know that all of them do, but that's the first step is to just check with your broker to see what the capability is there in regard to a dividend uh, reinvestment uh, program. Sometimes you have to go directly through the company itself, and the company will work with your brokerage. But start with your brokerage, and they'll be able to guide you in the right direction. Uh, before we wrap up, what is something about dividend stocks that you think maybe gets overlooked? Because for a lot of investors out there, um, dividend investing um, has a reputation, I would argue a good one. Um, we've talked a little bit about how it can be an income play. So uh, typically as people get older, uh, they tend to think more and more about dividend investing uh, as opposed to when they're younger and maybe they're more into growth stocks. I, you know, for me, it always, for dividend investing to me really all goes back to the longer you're going to be able to hold the stock, the more sense it makes. And you'll see in the financial media, the headlines every quarter, you know, you have the company's payout date, they make the dividend payment, and then the stock price adjusts a little bit the next day based on paying that out because you've got short-term traders trying to play a little sort of a dividend arbitrage, so to speak. And that really does just completely miss the point. Uh, for me, dividend investing is one of the most sensible uh, ways to invest. I mean, it's, it's, I'm not saying it's the only way, but I think every investor should have exposure to dividends because it takes a lot of the thinking out of it. Like I said, I mean, these are really good businesses that are paying these dividends. They're happy to be able to do it given that stage, given the success of the business. It's a source of pride for many of them. And, and like I said, I mean, it's kind of like a little thank you from the company to the investor saying, hey, listen, we appreciate you. Keep on honing our stock. We want to keep showing you that, that, we, that, we, that we should be in your portfolio. From a volatility perspective, this is why I like dividends, Chris. If you just look at the data in the S&P 500, the companies that have initiated and grown their dividend have not just outperformed the market by more than two base, 200 basis points or two percentage points each year, but they've done it with lower volatility than the market by almost 20 percent. Um, the companies that uh, have no change or those even worse that cut their dividend tend to be much more volatile than the market. So from a, from a volatility perspective, dividend payers give that sense of um, security, I think, that a lot of uh, investors can get behind. And they, the, the stocks tend not to trade as volatile as the market. And last Last point is also is it's no guarantee, 
But when you look at the year, look at the dividend aristocrats during the years of 2000, 2001, 2002, 2008, the time when the stock market was really volatile and down actually, dividend aristocrats um, outperformed the market. They, in 2008, they did lose money, they did lose, but, um, but they lost less than the market and in those early years in the 2000s um, after the stock um, tech bubble burst, they actually finished those years in positive in 2000, 2001 too. Yeah, and I think um, probably a lot of people don't really think about this. We've talked a lot about in, uh, inflation recently, and obviously it's been uh, fairly tame, but dividend investing usually provides you a nice uh, inflation-beating revenue stream there quarter in and quarter out, and that can be really meaningful, particularly as you get into that protect your wealth yep. stage of life where you depend more on that cash coming in. Uh, we talked some about Microsoft. Microsoft is just one of five stocks that is in our investing starter kit, which you can get by going to fool.com slash start. Again, we talked about Microsoft. There are four others in the kit, so check it out at fool.com slash start. Also, thanks again for giving us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe so you can catch all of our live YouTube videos. Andy Cross, Jason Moser, guys, thanks for being here. Thanks, Chris. Thanks so much for watching. Fool on.